let's shift now. We were just of in course. chapters one and two. Of course. Now, oh, we've just got the bulk of the book, right? All, all these really long speeches between these different characters. There's Job and these, the, these three friends. And yes. then this character, Ali, who comes up, who may be a good, by, good guy, maybe not a good guy. Yes. People debate. Yeah. We're not going to get into that. No. But that is, they are long. They yes. take a long time to read. If, if, if you even read one of those chapters out in church, people might come up and go, that, hey, that was a long reading today. Why are, why are we doing this? Yeah. What's going on in those speeches? And, ha- and again, how are you drawing the key applications you're seeing yes. out of all those speeches? Yeah. Yeah, that is a great question. I think there are several things going on. I think at a most basic level, the book, I, maybe I'm wrong. I think the book of Job is trying to frustrate us and wear us out and make us really anxious for God to speak. I think it wants to impress upon us. So, so if I try, if I've tried having quiet times right through the Book of Job, <laughs> and halfway through, I'm thinking, I know this is the Word of God, but I'm struggling. <laughs> That's, am I kind of getting the point? I think you are. I think you are kind of getting the point. Okay. I think the Book of Job itself reflects the experience it it explores. This is a a tiring, difficult, exhausting subject, and getting through the book that talks about suffering is tiring and difficult. And I think we're supposed to have this keen sense: we just want God to show up and speak to Job, and the human characters regardless of what they say is true, have no idea how to explain what happened to Job. Um, it's interesting to me that by the end of the book, Job takes back everything he says. I repent in dust. I, Job says, I cannot believe I have been criticizing my only true friend in all this. And yet all of Job's... Oh, so it turns out God is the real friend. Not, it turns not out God is the real friend, not the friends, Okay, <laughs> as okay. it turns out. At the same time, Job's speeches in which he criticizes God are still recorded for us. Why are they there when... What Job says is wrong when the the way Job tries to interpret his situation, his suffering chapters 1 to 2, is very understandable. And yet we know because we've been given more information, he gets it completely wrong. He understandably draws the conclusion, I haven't God, given God any reason to turn on me. Maybe he's not the person I thought he was. Maybe he's not a good person. And, you know, if if when people suffer in our churches, if they feel safe enough around you, they will probably start to say similar things. It's very frightening to hear from Christian brothers and sisters to hear them say. So what would be the contemporary equivalent that we could easily find ourselves hearing or even saying, which is like what these so-called friends say? So so, uh, this is terrible to say, but if you hear a friend in church say something like, I don't know how God is not an abusive parent. If I did what God did to me to my kids, that would be abuse. How is God any different? Now, for the most part, we keep that under, we know we shouldn't say that stuff. If Christians feel really safe around you, they might start to utter those dark thoughts about God. And that's essentially what Job says. Now, I think Job's speeches are recorded to help us be better friends to the modern-day Jobs we meet. So an essential quality of a Job-like ordeal is ignorance. If Job knows this is a test, then the, the devil can always turn around and say, well, of course, Job said that. He knows it's a test. Job can't know it's a test. God has to allow Job to fall into a position where Job look, where God looks mysterious to him. He will say in chapter 10, why'd you turn into my enemy when I didn't give you any re-? Anyway, as we read Job's speeches, we're thinking, Job, you poor guy, you, you just don't know enough. And if you just hang on, this is all going to work out really well. And probably similar thoughts will occur to us when we talk to modern day Job's. Working through this difficult, tiring book is training us in a kind of enduring friendship with modern-day Jobs, where we stick with them, we don't correct them, we don't sermonize at them, we don't win a theological argument. When someone starts saying really terrible things about God, it is so tempting to get in a theological argument with them. But it's useless. Even if you win, some people in pain say crazy things. And, and if, if someone says something about God that you, if another Christian does, that you find really troubling, you beat them in a theological argument. That doesn't really address the pain that gave rise to that crazy. Um, so it's just, as we're reading these long speeches by these three friends, yes, and maybe Elihu as well, if you think he's getting it wrong, which I think you think he is getting it wrong. I think he is. Oh, is that basically God saying through that, if you've got a friend who's going through like what Job is going through, as in mysterious suffering, don't talk to them like this. Basically. That's it. Basically. And even, yes. And what I, are the key things they say? Which we shouldn't say. Yes, yes. So so as we hear Job speak and we can't speak back, we're being trained to listen to Christian brothers and sisters say terrible things and just stick with them and not argue with them, which is what the friends do. The friends draw the reasonable inference 
the reasonable but completely incorrect inference. Um, so I'm sorry, let me interrupt myself and back up a little mm. bit. In the first chapter of the book, in verse 1, Job is a deeply sanctified, godly s- sinner, but a deeply sanctified saint. And as a result, the consequence is his life is blessed. Um, as Job and his friends see him lose the blessings of his obedience, the friends draw the reasonable conclusion that Job has lost his obedience as well, and he has compromised integrity with God in some secret way. So Job needs to confess that, and God is a good person. He will restore Job, and and the end of Job's life can be even more blessed than the beginning. So they continually pressure Job to to, uh, confess whatever sin it was that provoked God's wrath. And from their perspective, that is a reasonable inference to draw, and it is completely wrong, because it's not Job's sin that brought this terrible attack. It's just exactly his integrity. I think the text is trying to scare us, and as we listen to the friends talk and we think, they're actually being quite reasonable. And in some ways, to an extent, they could quote other parts of the Bible in support of what they're saying, and they're getting it, they're getting it completely wrong. They're torturing someone that God thinks so highly of, and they are incurring God's anger. At the end of the book, God says, Job has to pray for you and sacrifice for you, because I am so angry at how you talk to him. Yeah, That, that will... If that doesn't sort of make you stop and soberly reconsider how you talk to people at church, then almost nothing will. Mm, Thank you. Just a final question on these speeches. Yes. Thinking of Job's speeches. God says at the end, Job has spoken well. (laughs) What is that talking about? Do you really expect me to know that, Tim? (laughs) There are. You're the Old Testament guy here, Eric. (laughs) There are a couple. I don't know if this is the case. There are a couple places in the book of Job, whereas the poet narrator was writing it out. I wonder if he was chuckling to himself, thinking, boy, this is really going to knock them sideways. <laughs> Job's friends sound so reasonable mm. through the speeches. And Job, and Job is, says so much dodgy sounding stuff. He's, well, okay, Job will very admir- admirably hold on to God. He won't curse God. Okay. But he's, he says, God is, us- in chapter 16, he says, God is using me for target practice. Mm. Mm. Literally. He says he slashes open my kidneys, and and it's just, it's terrible. How did Job speak rightly about? Okay, now, I don't think that that can be a carte blanche approval of everything Job says, because not even Job approves of everything he says. Okay, right, yeah. Um, I, I, I think there are several things going on. First of all, the friends only talk about God. Job talks to God. Mm. Um, the friends, as the speeches go on, say less and less about God. Their theory of blessings for obedience dominates the whole horizon, and God stands as a midwife to that. I don't think the friends would have passed the accuser's test. They don't give much evidence of loving God for God. Mm. Um, And actually, ironically, when Job protests, he shows how much he values God. So in chapter 3, he says, this is not explicit, but I think what's going on in, in his mind, from Job's perspective, it looks like he's lost the favor and friendship of God for no reason he can think of. He hasn't. God's heart toward Job is unchanged, but it looks to him like he has. And Job says, he doesn't say, I wish I was dead. He says, I wish I had never been born in the first place. I wish I had never enjoyed that blessed life all these years. Mm -hmm. So the unstated implication is, if it turns out God and I haven't been friends this whole time, I'm not interested in the blessed life, which actually turns out to be really good theologically. (laughs) Job is not interested in the blessings of obedience if he can't be friends with God. So I suspect things like that. There's one other point where, where um, it's a little bit complicated in the Hebrew, but I think Job essentially says, I can, as it's in chapters 9 and 10, Job says, I can insist I did nothing to deserve what looks like this punishment as much as I, I want. But unless Job looks on me and says, Job, you're right, all my claims to rightness mean nothing. So there's an odd echo with, you know, Pauline justification and God saying, you're right in my eyes, and that's the truth about you. Even though the language is different, I think Job has the same theology. So Job expresses that in a negative way because he thinks he's undeservedly under the wrath of God, but he still Mm -hmm. shows the same high value for God and God's judgment of him. That's where I would go to say, to explain why God says Job spoke rightly. Great. Great insights. 